Hey, hello. This is the Innovators Insider Podcast. This is Mike LaFleche, the professor. I am joined by my good friend and colleague, Richard Doyle, the user group guy. How are you doing today, Richard? Uh, I'm doing great, Mike. It's a beautiful day here in Las Vegas. We finally got some springtime weather, and uh, I've got a big smile on my face because of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's going <laughs> to, it's spring has sprung here as well. First flowers starting to, uh, up here, you know, the, the bulb type uh, flowers are appearing. So it's really nice. It's good to see that. Um, and, and we have such an exciting show to spring off of that topic because we're going to talk about agile product design, hardcore agile product design for hardware. We have a very special guest who's a, a, a great, great author on the subject. Professor has been around the block. Um, and, and we'll also kind of intermingle how you might, uh, do this with Onshape. You know, you know, we, we have a fun paper that we've, uh, um, released a, a little while ago called, can your cad do this? We did a podcast on it a little while ago too, Richard. Yep. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, but we're going to have some in-depth, hardcore, agile, mechanical hardware stuff. This is real stuff where this is not. <laughs> just fluffy stuff that we're going to be talking about today I, you know and and i'm excited too because we were talking about this a little bit yesterday you know i've been out of the design business for a long long time i'm more into the people business so some of the stuff that's coming up here is is really going to be an eye-opener for me and, and i assume maybe some of our guests as well um so I, I tell you what why don't we uh you know our guest today he's an educator an author a builder uh, of uh, airplanes, uh, has a doctorate in mechanical engineering from Ohio State University, the U. Uh, but he may be best known to our audience as the author of The Mechanical Design Process, uh, which he first published back in 1992, and now it's in its sixth edition. So let's welcome David Ullman to the show. Hello, David. Thank you. Appreciate being here. Nice to have you, David. So nice to, to meet you and uh you know, your, your, your books on, on the topic of mechanical design process have been, uh, you know, definitely helpful for, for so many people. And, and it's so awesome to have you, uh, here today. So what I thought would be interesting would be to share with the audience a little bit about your history and, um, you know, where, you know, what your chops are on this uh, topic and, and share with uh, the audience, you know, what the challenges are with agile product development and, and all the things that, that, that everybody's here for the podcast to hear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have some visuals here that I'm going to share here on the screen. And, uh, you know, here's a little bit more information about uh, David's history here, but David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, you asked me to do a little bit of history, so I think I can I can do this pretty well for you. When I was in um, the 1970s, when I was doing my PhD at Ohio State, there was a professor there, uh, John Starkey, and he was the first person I ever came across that started talking about design as a process. Prior to that, uh, in every design course I ever took, it was the analysis of nuts, bolts, gears, bearings, control systems, whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he began to tease out the, the fact that there was a, things you should be doing and there were rules for doing those and techniques and tools for helping you actually design things besides the analysis that went along with it. And so uh, when I was a professor at uh place called Union College in upstate New York, I began to tease apart the basic design course for ME students into two separate courses. One was about the process and the other was about the design of machine elements. And then when I joined the faculty at Oregon State University in 1984, uh, part of the deal with me coming was that I'd be able to really split these into two courses, which I did uh, at that time. And out of that came the book, The Mechanical Design Process. And to put this in context, when I wrote this book in 91 and published it in 92, the word process was very problematic. I didn't know whether to use the word or not use the word. I was used to, as a mechanical engineer, thinking about uh, <clears throat> you know, processes in terms of flows of materials, uh, in terms of 
of control processes, but to talk about design as a process, that term was not used in 1992 or was just barely beginning to be used. And so I took a chance <clears throat> and titled the book that, and it turned out, um, well, I've named a lot of things over my career, and most of them weren't successful. This one I hit hit pretty much dead on, I think. <coughs> by the um, just before that, by the late '80s, there was beginning to form a community of people thinking about design as a process, and so in the late '80s, I was instrumental in forming the ASME Design Theory Methodology Committee, which is now I think 35 years old or 37, whatever it works out to be. Um, and the community has developed around that uh, over time. In fact, the first time I met John Hirschstick, the, the founder of Onshape, uh, he was still an MIT graduate student you know, working for some professors that were involved in this early uh, realization of design as a process. Mm. Mm, that, that's interesting. So, so yeah, the, there's been a lot of, I remember that, you know, like, you know, back, you know, when I first started doing design back in the mid nineties, you know, design process thinking that wasn't really a thing. We were we were just starting to get uh, Gantt charts and, and things like that to try to manage projects and things like that, but never to the detail of like the, the actual process of doing mechanical engineering, like, like you get into. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me continue on. I'll put the, uh, slideshow back on here for us yeah here here are the uh continuing uh books that okay that you, you so know. i'll 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 talk to that for a second because that'll even bring us more up to date um <clears throat> so um one of the things that came out of working on this book was a, a lot of case studies and i think there's 13 i think there's 16 now case studies but but the other thing that happened was um, over the editions, and it's now in its sixth edition, the main book, um, I, I wove in more and more lean technology, but I was aware of Agile since, well, maybe 15 years ago, I began to hear of Agile, because I've done a lot of work with computer scientists also. And so I was aware of it, but I didn't know how it fit into mechanical engineering and mechanical and even electromechanical design. Do realize that academically, a uh, teaching design process has been much more a uh, mechanical engineering discipline than it has electrical or, or computer engineering. Um, and so that's sort of been the hotbed of it is, is the mechanical. And so uh, I began to get really interested in the teens uh, about how does Scrum affect mechanical engineering? And or can you do Scrum or Agile in mechanical engineering? I'll use the two terms interchangeably because I think the most used Agile uh, methodology is, is the Scrum. Um, and so I began, like any good professor, I figured, well, the way you're going to learn about something is write a book on it or teach it. So I started doing both and started doing consulting in it also. And uh, the, the Scrum for Hardware Design is is a fairly early book and and not as mature as what I could write now, uh, but it began to, to form the, the basis uh, of, of that. And actually what I've done is I've got a new book coming out later this year called Product Design Best Practices, which integrates the Scrum in, and the Lean into the, the design process for mechatronic products. And so that's in process. Can't wait to see it. Neither can I. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is an interesting graphic for the people that are uh, listening on audio only. You might want to take a look at the uh, the, the video podcast later on. But, um, you yeah, know, we have a nice graphic here of uh, Scrum for Hardware Design. Um, I was wondering if you could walk us through uh, this chart here, David, um, and, and maybe kind of compare it to what people are doing now that aren't doing Scrum-based processes, uh, if, if you could. Sure. Um, this particular graphic was, was my interpretation of 
uh, a basic scrum diagram. Um, scrum's always represented as two circles, a big circle, which is primarily the planning, and the little circle, which is the actual doing. And it was meant to tie the little book uh, about Scrum together. And so over on the left, I talk about what you need to do before you're doing any of, any of the Scrum or any of the design work. And that is you need to have a team and you need to have design goals and you need to have some kind of tools to manage things in. And on this particular graphic, I have a Scrum board, but it could also be a Gantt chart. And I think since I drew this, if I was going to redraw it, I'd probably put, uh, instead of Scrum board, I would put Scrum board and Gantt chart. Because I think the reality is that from a high level, a high management level, there has to be some kind of, of flow of, of high level uh, tasks that need to be done. And then when you get down to scrum level, these are the day-to-day, week-to-week tasks. So from a 30,000 foot, I still think you need Gantt charts and those kinds of organization schemes. Yeah. And you can begin to get down on what I call a scrum board, which is very similar to a Kanban board. Uh, you can get down to that into the, you know, the shorter time. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I've done a little bit, got a little bit more mature is, is I now talk about two backlogs. I talk about a product backlog and a task backlog. And the product backlog is all the things you need to do or project backlog. I, I vacillate which one I call it, but these are all the things you need to do to finish the project. Okay. And they may be high level things like, you know, we, we, have, we have to design X system. So it may be at a really high level. Whereas a task is what tasks do you have to do in the immediate future in order to get something done, which is progress towards the high level things that are on your, your project backlog. Right. So one's a macro and one's a micro. So one might be like, you know, here I am, I'm designing a, an entire electric bike. That might be a, a product backlog uh item but a um and a, a task would be more like oh i need to design the crank on on the electric bike you know this is going to be you know it's going to take me a couple weeks to, to figure it out well i i would i'd give a uh, i'll i'll do a little uh riff on your your example the project might be designed electric bike but some of the some of the high level things, some of the project things is, um, you know, you've, you've got to design the storage system. You've got to design the power system. You've got to design the suspension system, all these big systems that need to be designed. Whereas when you get down on the sprint level or the, the detailed task level, uh, you need to, to be worrying about, you know, what parts and components and, and, and fasteners and those kinds of things. And if it's an electric bike, you know, there may be some tasks about, you know, deciding what type of motor to use or what type of battery to use, those kinds of things, Thanks. or the detail things. Got it. So, so then the diagram goes into these two to four week um, sprint cycles. And as I understand it, Onshape is on a three-week cycle, and I've worked with companies as short as two weeks or as long as four. And and basically, these are, are I would call them planning cycles, trying to figure out what are we going to do next in the design project. And so <clears throat> uh, typical of those is updating the tasks that we need to do, then actually starting doing the tasks is is within that or is a smaller circle and then at the end of that uh, uh sprint is what they're generally called is a sprint review which is which is reviewing what is the pro process what progress have we made on the product itself? And then also a retrospective review is how are we doing in our process and how can we improve our process? So one of the real gifts here, uh, there's a couple uh, real gifts, I think, in looking at um, uh, from a sprint viewpoint or from an agile viewpoint is, is one is paying real attention to what tasks you're working on right now versus what tasks you know you have to do in the future and managing those in some realistic way, not on a Gantt chart because that's at a much higher level. 
And the other, this, this whole thing about retrospectives is really interesting, and that is uh, being very meta about what you're doing and going back and reviewing it and saying, you know, we could have done this better, we could have done that better, this worked pretty well, Those, and doing that on a frequent cycle. I think the other thing is um, doing Scrum forces you to make smaller, take smaller bites, smaller tasks. And I think that's a good thing for management and getting work done. Yeah. Uh, and back to the diagram, the do cycle, which is the littler circle, is actually developing the product artif artifacts and and updating um, your tools for managing the process, which is the, the scrum board, which is, uh, as I mentioned before, also like a Kanban board. Right. So that's basically the diagram. It's the same for software. It's just a little tweaked here. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, in, in your uh, in your slides here that I looked at earlier, you, you did a great job at, at kind of explaining some of the challenges and in, 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 uh, in hardware design, you know, scrum for hardware design and, in, um, you know, for each of the topics coming up. So let me let me get into that, like because you mentioned hardware and software and this this process has been utilized, you know, in, in almost every modern software company that I know of that that's of scale anyway would use this this process now, you know, that that you illustrate you know, using. Yeah, a, a comment before we dive into these. I went looking for some good examples of <coughs> excuse me, companies using um, these methods. Uh, you know, a major successful companies using these methods on hardware. And uh, John Deere is an example that comes up often, although I've done no work with them. Um, Tesla does some some variation of this. The, the company I'm most familiar with is Saab Aerospace. And uh, they've been doing this for years and years, very successfully, um, turning out fighter aircraft that are much better design than they were doing in the past. So it, it's really possible to do this. I found it's been more adopted in Europe and the U.S. at this point for the, the hardware, which is interesting because the Scrum Agile methodology starts in software in the U.S., migrates to Europe. The Europeans apply it more to hard, uh, begin to apply it more and more to hardware, and that's slowly working its way back to the U.S. as best I can tell. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. So you want to go through those? Yeah. 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 So I made a list a couple of years ago of 13 ways I saw that mechanical were really was really different, and and how why it was challenging, and and one of the things that software is going for it is it's very modular. Writing in the old days we'd call them subroutines, but now objects, and and uh, we don't break down hardware in, in the same way, but um it it made even in the early versions of the my book i talked about um when you're designing you got to design from the interfaces into the body of parts and assemblies but i like the way the scrum people talk about it as stable fixed interfaces and what uh, what they mean and what i mean by that is 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 where where systems or assemblies mate with others you got to fix that and know about that before you design all of the, the hardware and the functionality that interfaces with it. Because then if you change something on one side, you've got control over how that affects the other side of that interface. So I'm thinking about how you would implement some, like what, what would you consider a stable interface if you were like designing a you know, bicycle frame where the electric battery was mounting it. Like, you know, what, what would be a stable interface that you could share with people? Well, um, a real, uh, there's already some out, I mean, it's not a new concept. It's sort of a new way of thinking, but, but if you think about it, a connector, just a connector from the battery to the rest of the circuitry, most connectors are stable fixed interfaces. You can put different batteries in, you could put different motors in and the connector could remain the same. And that would be both both physically how it connected together, but also functionally it's transmitting 
um, DC, you know, has a positive and negative to transmit DC current. And so there's a lot of these around, but when you're designing something, think about how it's going to um, go together or come apart, both functionally and physically, and say, okay, can we can we put something fixed there? Can we fix something there so that if if Bob's designing on one side and Jane's designing on the other, they can design all they want to without affecting the other person. And yeah. if, if something needs to affect the other person, they've got a clear boundary of communication, both form and functionally. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. I will try. It's, to just, show. it's a way of thinking, yeah. I think, more than anything. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So, uh, yeah, that that's uh, that's a great answer because it was more than just. You yeah. Know, and by doing do this modularity that. to take it into the scrum world, it allows you to do smaller uh, tasks. Yeah. You know, you've you've sliced the problem thinner. Makes sense. Um, one of the things that mechanical and electromechanical systems has is longer design cycles. Um, you know, on shapes on a three week a three week cycle, um, that's pretty impossible to do for most electromechanical things. I mean. Um, you know, 3D printing has certainly made things much faster, but, um, you know, you, you, pulling it off is very difficult. Now, that being said, Saab, Saab's been doing it for years. So it depends on what you expect to have done at the end of two or four weeks. Because one of the things Scrum requires is that you have some deliverable at, each, at the end of each cycle. So it depends on what you define as that deliverable. Right, right. So you can break things down in the smaller chunks than you might normally do in a yep. traditional kind of longer stage process, even though project, you know, you know, we have things in on shape that take several sprints, of course, to design and we, we build it up to a certain point and then, you know, it works and then we continue, continue moving forward. So in hardware, this can also be done obviously as well. And, you know, we're seeing more and more electrical and mechanical people working together where, you know, this, this thought process kind of makes a lot of sense too. Yep. Um, Higher functional independence. Interdependence. Interdependence. Sorry. Yes. Not <laughs> independence. Independence. So, so when you write code, you can, you can write, you know, like little routines that do their own thing. But boy, that's really hard to do. Um, this diagram here I actually stole from a paper back in the 80s someplace, which was um, the point of the figure was, if you design a fingernail clipper where all functionality was independent, so each, each, each function had its own module, this is what a fingernail clipper would look like. <laughs> okay? It's like your... Um... Richard, I remember your uh, jelly uh, slicer. For yeah, that exactly. kind of reminds <laughs> me of the the, the cranberry <laughs> slicer. Yeah, cranberry <laughs> slicer. We'll have to put a link Li to that. In the, in it the was show. a little over designed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether you'd call this over designed, but it uh, <laughs> you can see every function in there is independent, and and you know to to be to do an elegant mechanical or electromechanical design there's high functional interdependence. The example I use in my books often is uh, the handlebars on a bicycle. We go back to the bicycle theme. And that is the handlebars on a bicycle are just a bent piece of tubing and they provide no function unto themselves. As far as steering is concerned, they need all the other components of the bicycle in order to steer. But in order to do braking, because you put the brake levers on the bicycle, in order to do braking, well, they need the brake levers and all the other things to perform that function. And as far as balance is concerned, you know, you need the handlebars, but then you need the seat and the pedals so you can do your body English to stay balanced. So the, the interdependence of functionality is much, much worse on mechanical or electromechanical systems. Yes. So that's... That's the point there. It makes it a challenge. It doesn't say you can't do it. It just says you got to be aware of it. And it's yeah, you got to think differently. Yeah, you can't yeah. do the same processes that you're doing now to achieve that result with this, you know, agile hardware workflow. 
Um, the next one was um, uh, in in um, in the software world. They talk about refactoring, which is really rewriting to make things simpler, or reusing. And you know, we do that. You buy belts and and cogs off the shelf and all that. Um, and you can redo so, uh, hardware to make it simpler. Uh, and here's the fingernail clipper taken to its its all functions in one form limit of one piece. And that's manufacturable. I've never really seen one like that, but maybe there is. Um, but it doesn't offer quite the same refactoring opportunities that the software does. Because because once you start building something or reduce it to any kind of practice, to go back and redo it is really, really hard. Yeah. It's time consuming. Uh, the next one, this is a pretty big one. Um, the whole the whole name of, of Scrum comes from rugby because when you're playing rugby, uh, a group of people run down the field with a ball and pass it back and forth. And when the one guy's starting to get tackled, he throws it off to another person, the ball off to another person, and they keep running. And this was one of the concepts in the software was in the daily standup, <clears throat> you know, you could say, hey, I'm falling behind on this functionality. And if you were coding in Python, there might be somebody else in, on the team that also codes Python and, and is pretty far ahead on what they're doing. They could say, hey, I'll take this and do it. But I recently worked with a company that was designing um, pressure gauges. Uh, a big company is designing pressure gauges. And they were coming out with a whole new line of digital pressure gauges. And the design team consisted of a mechanical engineer who was worried about the the housing and the casing and the fittings and uh, electrical engineer who was designing the PC board and a code person who was worried it was designing the firmware and there's no way they could cover for each other. Their domains were just, you know, so specialized that, that they couldn't do the swarming that, that uh, Scrum wants you to do. So that's a, that's a reality that there is no real good solution for. Makes sense. Okay. I've sort of mentioned this before because all these are not independent, but, um, you know, to demonstrate functionality, which is what you'd like to do at the end of each sprint, of each two to four week sprint, is, is much harder uh, than it is for software. And, uh, you know, this has gotten better with, you know, finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics and will continue to get better. But it's still, uh, takes a longer time certainly certainly yeah there are tools obviously people have access to and we'll we'll bring those things up of course this is a big one also and uh, this comes out of the mechanical design process book and it's just a plot that shows the percentage of the um, cost committed versus time in a project and uh, uh you know you in mechanical and electrical electromechanical you you commit a lot very early and so the cost to change things gets increasing increases as the project goes on in software to change you can change code up to the last minute and you haven't really cost a whole lot but here you know let's say you change material for some reason at the 12th hour you might have to change all your manufacturing processes and and you know, lots of other things that um, just you just can't do. So it's the shape of this curve that's Im important. The cost committed curve um, is much flatter for software than it is for uh, for hardware. Yeah, for hardware, you want to find those things much earlier. In the much, process. much. Yeah, you want to. And, and then you can't. Then you don't have the the. Uh, you just don't have the ability to change. You're locked into things. And I've got a project going right now where I made a decision um, a year ago and it's costing me a lot of time and money and I still having trouble making it work. And I desperately don't want to jump horses now because I will have lost a lot of time and money. It's just the reality. Yeah. 
Yeah. So anything you can do to, to find problems earlier or understand the problem better is, is something that... Uh, well, and also have the discipline yeah. not to change things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's also a good point. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next one is uh, more demanding range of operations. Um, you know, you design a piece of hardware and it might have to operate under the ocean, up in the sky, um, you know, very different environmental situations um, and over a lot of different time with, with you know, might have to run clean, run dirty, um, you know, just a bigger range of operations. The closest software has to this is to say, well, it's got to run on, on an Apple and a Mac uh, or it's got to run under, you know, version 10 and version 11. But that's not as demanding, I think, is is what electromechanical things have to do. Absolutely. Uh, the next one is uh, different testing demands, and you know, testing hardware. Well, you can—I I mean, excuse me, testing software. You can actually write software code within the software to te so it's self-testing. But you you really can't do that with too many electromechanical systems. And in fact, on, on this slide, I have a. A diagram, I think it's a 777 at Boeing, where they're testing the wing flexure. And the, the device that actually uh, does the testing is a major design project in and of itself and costs many millions of dollars. Um, so, uh, you know, testing can be much more challenging for, uh, for hardware than it can be for software. Yeah, even with FEA and CFD, it's still you, you have to have physical testing, obviously, for for many many products, yep. and obviously in the aerospace industry yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, number ten, more more secondary design activities. Um, by by that I mean um, design is just part of it because you're designing so something can be manufactured and distributed and tested and delivered and supported, and you know you have some of this in 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 software but you don't have to manufacture you don't have to deliver in a, in a you know a physical way that might call create might might require installation so it's just the there are more secondary design activities in hardware right <laughs> um number 11 was more challenges in developing specifications one of the things i learned out of function uh, out of the uh Scrum, Agile Scrum methodology is the, the, the idea of a story. And I'd never worked in stories. I'd worked in, you know, you have customer requirements and you evolve those into engineering specifications and know how to do that real well and wrote about it. Um, but, but the software people talk in terms of stories. And it turns out it's doing the same thing as requirements and specifications, but it's another way to come at it that I actually think works pretty well. And so in the new book, I've woven the stories in with the, the specifications uh, development. So, um, uh, but, you know, in, 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 in software, the user interface, which is where the stories come from, is, is rather one-dimensional. Uh, whereas with hardware, it can be many, many dimensions. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're more complex. It's harder to do. Yes. Yes. Now every, by the way, but since I said that every time I say this to software people, they say, well, you think everything about what you're doing is harder than what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's physical, uh, it's physical stuff. You're cutting metal. You know, there's there's lead time. You know, to to make these things. You know, there, there's a or, lot. Or you're or you're soldering in in microprocessors and resistors or whatever. Yeah. Um. So number twelve is higher difficulty proving a task is done. Um. And there I have the quote: "Are we done yet?" Uh. Part of the Scrum methodology is the original scrum methodology was you'd have something at the end of each sprint that you can deliver to the customer. They can use it and break it and you get good feedback from that and helps you move forward. But you know, that's so much more, you can't do that with physical objects. So, you know, how do you define done in terms of, 
what whether you're done or not with a specific um, uh, specific sprint. Right. And the last one I have is is a higher price for premature commitment. And I mentioned that earlier is that if you you know once you get pretty far downstream, the cost to change horses is has gotten pretty high. So um, and higher than it does in software. So um, you uh, yeah, it's just something else to pay attention to. So there's a list of 13 of these. Um, I've had some really interesting discussions with people, whether I got too many or too few, uh, interested in thoughts on them. If anybody has any feedback. Yeah. I mean, that, that was extremely helpful, David. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really nice to see, um, you know, you articulate these points and, and I wanted to kind of try to correlate some of the points that you were making with with points that could be actions taken by on shape users to try to help design more in that mode right and and what i'm going to do is share this screen i've been working up a bike over the past few days um you know it's not quite done yet obviously you know there's no, no chains no motor you know I, I, it's a folding e-bike you know essentially so you know we fold the thing in half and you know we can throw it in the back of the trunk you know that kind of thing so um so what i wanted to do is try to go through some of those points that i recalled uh, one of them was all about communication and tasks and, and backlogs, right? So in, in the world of Onshape, you can have communication going on inside of your design world, right? So as you're working, you can work with people. So these are people here at my company here uh, on our uh, European team. And they're talking about the design process here of this bike and they can view things, they can label things on the 3D CAD model directly, reply to comments, add custom code or anything to comments, um, and even assign them as tasks and resolve them. So for example, I go to the task list here. Here's my main screen, here's my action items. And here I can see my task list. You know, these are my tasks. You know, I could look at any, any task here to kind of see what's going on, any open task. Right. So very easy to kind of see, you know, what's going on with the, the actions uh, that you have. So that's, that's one thing I thought would be kind of helpful in the world of an agile team doing work, right? You know, the ability to clearly see what's going on, uh, work with each other. Um, so that that's one thing. Um, the other thing is is the the way I've done the design process for this bike. And Onshape is very unique in the fact that we can keep track of different variants of the design as we're going through our design process. For example, here's the main timeline. So if you, if you look at any kind of agile you know, Git style product uh, development, you would have uh, a workspace, a main workspace, and you might branch off and try out different ideas, right? So the very first thing I did, so here's the start of my design way back here on March 20th, where there's nothing here. But the very first thing I did is I created a development branch. And then from that development branch, all of my work, um, you know, would continue. And then maybe, you know, let's, uh, that's an assembly. There's nothing in it, but here's the, the frame as it began, right? So here I am back on March 22nd designing the elements of this bicycle frame. Then... I was able to branch off and you know, I, I needed to get into the to the um the handlebar design, for example. And then, you know, that that was coming off of another point in time. And then from here you can see I have my handlebar coming together. I have a handlebar assembly, and uh, you know, I haven't mounted it yet uh to the frame. In fact, I think I 
put it in at the top level uh, assembly. Um, but all of this is happening on these branches, which could be done by the same person or by different people, right? You could, you could have, you know, your specialist working on the handlebar stuff and the other specialists working on the battery area of the design. Um, or, you know, they could all be working together. It doesn't really matter in Onshape because of the lack of files. We don't have a file system. We, we all operate off of a database. There is no files being lobbed around which is a challenge when you're doing collaborative work. If you have files and you have to lob them around, you have to buy a big expensive PDM, even with PDM as, um, you know, we've talked about on the show quite a bit, you know, it still doesn't promote people working at the same time. Um, it, it only uh, kind of helps manage the chaos of people um, checking in and checking out files. Whereas with Onshape, it's, you know, you're working on the live work in progress with people. But you can, as you mentioned, David, stabilize the design at a certain point. Let's say I'm over here on my, uh, let's just go to the, the part studio for my rim. I'm ready to get the rim manufactured, but I'm not done with the tire yet. As you can see, I don't have any treads or anything like that. <laughs> so if I wanted to release for production, this particular rim, even though I designed it all here together in this database, I can release that and it will go through a, a workflow process, right? And you can design different workflow processes in Onshape. So here is the uh, an agile project-based workflow or a non-project-based workflow, which I've you know, which allows you to just kind of pick and choose who you want to be a peer reviewer, right? Everybody in my company who is an engineer is on the peer review team, right? So you can set it up in, with Scrum kind of based rules. In fact, if I go back over here. Here, let's, uh, let's create a project for the e-bike. And this e-bike is going to work in an agile product sprint type fashion. And then here are the different permission schemes that you can assign to the different people inside of your uh, scrum, right? You know, you, perhaps uh, uh, Cody is the scrum master. Perhaps uh, Paul is the uh, product owner, right? So you can have all of these different roles assigned to people which give different permissions. Right now, these people have all permissions, but let's pick a different person, um, user experience person, Mary Marketing. Mary Marketing has common export link and view, right? And these permissions can change over the life of your project, of course. And then being able to understand what's going on in your company through analytics, you know, what's going on, what, what kind of activities are going on? How do you measure what is going on during your design sprints and activities is a dashboard. So it's just uh, producing the dashboard now, having gone in here for, for a little bit. Let's uh, modify, well, that's, that's not very exciting modeling time. Oh, that's <laughs> because that, that's my user that I never do any modeling time on. So let me uh, go to something else. All right, here's a, all of my activities in 2020, just as one report that I had run. So all of this information is measurable because Onshape is cloud-based SaaS. There's no files going back and forth. Every single action is tracked as a database transaction. It, it's much easier now to get detailed information about what's going on in your engineering department, right? You know, I can see as an engineering manager, you know, all the project activities by project, by release status, where are people accessing my data? Um, you know, it's all it's all right here, and I can then dive into a project dashboard. So you can just kind of keep diving in and more and more. Here are the people working. Here are the people working on that project. Activity over time. It's a big machine design over a long period of time. So that's you know a little bit about how you would try to do agile mechanical product design in Onshape using some of the um, 
you know, the items that you had mentioned, there, there's more, um, but, you know, just a, a quick high level smattering uh, of activities. I don't know if you have any comments on that, David, if, if I was completely off base or not, you can let me know. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think you were completely off base. And I, and, and I do think on shape um, with its non-file structure is more supportive of Scrum than, than a, a system with a file structure. Um, I'm going to throw down something for you here. Um, I was called in in the early 90s to help Autodesk when they they had a, a a project called Rubicon that became Inventor. Yeah. And and I I told them at the time this is long ago. I said, hey, you guys need to to push more towards process. I mean, all the CAD stuff is wonderful. All the drawing, solid modeling, all that stuff's really wonderful. But you got to push more towards integrating the process and what to do next and how to move forward in the design. And I think it's come a long way. I think it's still got a ways to go, though. Yeah. Yeah. If you ask John Hurstick, you know, he still thinks we're in the beginning days. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I mean, it's still, there's still a long way to go. Absolutely. Yep. But yeah, being able to at least, you know, articulate that you're working on different areas of the design. You, know, you have design flow, you can compare, you can merge changes back in, you can release items, you can have reports and analytics. It's uh, by far and away uh, a more streamlined approach for a company that embraces the agile uh, uh, principles. I, I, you know, as far as, you know, we have a number of customers, you know, working this way, obviously, in Onshape. Yep. Let me let me jump in here and at least contribute something to this episode. And that is a nice little link here. Uh, so for some more information on becoming agile with your product uh, development, you can go ahead and read this blog. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Excellent. Excellent. So this was a an interesting show. I think, you know, this this was this was a this was a lecture. This was a class. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't quite mean to make it that way. No, no, no. I, I, I really appreciate it for one, Dave. Like, you know, I think I said early on that I've been out of the actual engineering processes for so long that, uh, you know, it's really hard to keep up. And uh, it, it's nice to see some of this stuff coming out. And it's nice to know now that, you know, I'm, a, I'm more of a football fan, but I understand rugby enough to know what a scrum is. <laughs> uh, but now I know what it, it can mean on the other, uh, on the other side. So uh, I really appreciate the information and the education. So thank you. Okay. And anybody that wants to get in touch with me with ideas, push back, whatever you can send me an email at, or go to my website, davidolman.com or send me email at olman at davidolman.com. Terrific. That's great. That's great. Well, well, I think uh, that's where we will, where we will, leave it today <laughs> I'm all twisted <laughs> after after a fun show so yep. that, that's uh, my fault that you're tongue-tied now michael because i didn't you know i didn't contribute a whole lot to this episode and you did all the talking so um you know i'll uh i'll see what i can do next time to uh try to take some of the burden away from you no yeah you got you got the gift of the gab richard i mean totally so. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah this this was a great show and i i really uh I'm excited that this uh, this turned out really well, and I think uh, good. I mean, a lot of uh, people that have listened to the show that have a lot of great ideas, and they'll have a lot of questions. So definitely reach out to David, reach out to us. Um, we have a number of agile kind of related offerings coming in the uh, the future here at Onshape. So stay tuned. Look at the website, things like that. So let's. And uh, Oh, yep, yeah. To help help us out a little bit, if they would hit the like button for us and subscribe so that you don't ever miss an episode, uh, especially the every three week live streams that we enjoy doing so much and sharing in the chat with our friends uh, that join us on those streams. So keep up to date with the Innovators Insider podcast. Very good. Well, have a great day, everybody. We'll see you around. Thank you, David. So long. Uh -huh.